Welcome to lesson two for this unit for limits. Uh, this one's titled Limits Analytically, but when you read analytically, the word I want you to have in your head is algebraically. And the only difference between this lesson and the last one is we're going to go from you know, looking at graphs to looking at actual defined functions, you know, things like x squared, square root of x, anything like that. So first of all, what I want you to recall is what is a limit? I was just pausing, make sure you can actually come up with that definition on your own, and then restart the video when you think you have a good definition for what a limit is. Now hopefully you're able to recall that a limit talks about the y value a function approaches from both sides of a given x value. That is, unless we are talking about a one-sided limit, in which case we can focus on just the left or right side. What we are going to look at is the idea of finding a limit, and this is kind of incomplete because you've already looked at finding limits. Again, that idea is we're looking at finding that limit analytically or algebraically. Again, the only big difference is that we're going to be given some actual function where f of x is equal to our y value. And when we're actually given a defined function, one of the easiest things that we can do, and one of the first things we should always try to do, is direct substitution. Take that given x value that we're talking about and try to plug it into the function. A lot of times you'll know the behavior of the function, you'll know if that's going to make sense to utilize this particular method. Uh, the second thing that we can do, because sometimes direct substitution is going to fail, we might get functions that are not defined at certain values, but we know definition does not mean that the limit exists or doesn't exist. So the other thing that we're going to be looking to do is we're going to be looking to simplify and then try direct substitution, because direct substitution is always going to be the key for these problems. If we can do it and get a number back, that's going to be our answer, even if we have to do a little work beforehand. Uh, ways that we might look to simplify, make sure you are good on factoring. If you're good on factoring, things like rational functions, factoring numerator and denominator and canceling out like terms, that's a skill that we want to make sure that we've carried over from previous material. And being able to rationalize. And when I say rationalize, hopefully that's getting you to think about if you see square roots. Now there is a third way, and it's called L'Hopital's Rule. It's meant for what are known as the indeterminate forms. And we'll get to those as we go through examples. But the indeterminate forms are problems where we end up getting something like a 0 divided by 0 or an infinity divided by infinity. Uh, things that don't really exist and we can't tell very much about the problem. This we're actually going to come back to in a later unit, so just keep it in the back of your mind. Limits will get revisited. Don't think that we're going to start this and then it's going to go completely away. We'll see this throughout the rest of the course. So looking at the very first one. This idea of direct substitution. Think about this first example. The limit as x approaches negative 1 for x squared plus 2x minus 4. Now this function, if you were to think about graphing it, would be some sort of right side up parabola. So for a function like this, what we're going to be calling a continuous function in a future lesson, the limit is always going to assume the function's value. So for this particular function, all I have to do is just take negative 1 and plug it in everywhere I see my x value and get a final answer of negative 5. I know looking at a parabola, no matter what point I pick out, the left and right side are always going to go to the same value and it's going to approach the actual function's value. Another function that we know will do this is a square root function. Square root functions start at a certain point and continue to go. We know that we can't have any negatives, so as long as my limiting value, in this case, my limit as x approaches 2, as long as 2 does not cause this square root to be negative, I should be able to evaluate this one by direct substitution as well. Any point along this curve, I know the left and right sides are going to match up. So evaluating this one would be as simple as square root of 3 times 2, minus 2, which is the square root of 4, and my overall limit would be positive 2. Now, where we're going to have some issues. Look at a problem like number 3. 
the limit as x approaches 0 of 4x squared minus 5x all over x. We always want to try direct substitution first. So we could say for this one, we're going to plug a 0 in everywhere I see x. But here is that idea of the indeterminate form. What we get is 0 divided by 0. This is meaningless. That does not exist. So does that mean the limit doesn't exist? Well, not necessarily, because we've already seen problems where a hole in the graph means the function value doesn't exist, but the limit still could. So what we're going to try with this is we are going to go ahead. We're going to see if we can use algebra to simplify this a little bit. And looking at this particular problem, I see that, well, in that numerator, one thing I can do is I can factor out an x. Notice I've brought back in my limit notation because I'm not substituting anything in right now. I'm still evaluating that limit. I want to keep that limit notation there. And notice numerator and denominator both now have a factor of x. I can cancel those out. And now the important thing is what I get to left over here, this becomes the limit as x approaches 0 of 4x minus 5. This function is exactly the same as 4x squared minus 5x all over x except this function is also defined at 0. So I can now substitute in the value of 0 and get a final answer of negative 5. So let's try the one right next to it then. 2x squared plus 13x minus 7 all over x plus 7. I want to know the limit as x goes to negative 7. Well, substituting in on this one, probably you already looked to the denominator and you can tell we're going to have an issue here. I'm definitely going to have a divide by 0 in the denominator. And in the numerator, I am also going to have a 0. So there's my indeterminate form again, which means I can't actually stop right there. But what I can notice is I do have a quadratic in the numerator. So I could try factoring that. And in this case, that will factor. It will, in fact, factor into 2x minus 1 and x plus 7. And I'm going over that very quickly, but... Make sure your factoring skills are at that point where you can get through those pretty quickly, and if not, please make sure you seek help on that. And after I factor the numerator, notice both the numerator and denominator have a factor of x plus 7. I can cancel those out. And what I'll say is this function, everywhere other than at negative 7, will be exactly the same as the function 2x minus 1. And I can now evaluate this by direct substitution and get negative 15. There are a couple other types of things that we want to be on the lookout for. One of those things is this idea of rationalizing. So again, let's look at the limit that we're given. The limit as x approaches 5 of the square root of x plus 4 minus 3 all over x minus 5. So the same issue we've been having. We're going to try to substitute 5 in. Always try that first because you might be surprised. Really complicated examples might actually be very, very simple. Notice that this would be the square root of 9, which is just 3. 3 minus 3 is 0, all over 0. There's my indeterminate form again. But notice I can't factor on this one to try to get past the indeterminate form. This isn't going to be as straightforward. But what I can do is I can take one fact from all of our studies in algebra that we hopefully remember, and that's this one. That if I take a plus b times a minus b, I'm going to get a squared minus b squared. What I'm going to try as just a trick to try to help me through this is to rationalize that numerator. And I'm going to multiply it by its conjugate. Square root of x plus 4 plus 3. In order to get that difference of squares that I just pointed out over here on the right. And whatever I multiply the top by, I've got to multiply the same in the denominator. And notice now, utilizing difference of squares, I'm going to get a squared. I'm going to get the square root of x plus 4 times itself, which will just be x plus 4. I'm also going to get minus 3 squared, or minus 9. All over, and I'm going to keep this separate. I don't want to multiply this all out. It's just going to make a huge mess. But simplifying that even one step further, that's going to be x minus 5 over x minus 5 times the square root of x plus 4 plus 3. Notice now I have a factor of x minus 5 in both the numerator and denominator. And this whole thing is just going to become 
the limit as x approaches 5 of 1 over square root of x plus 4 plus 3. A function that acts exactly the same as the original, except it is defined at 5. And since it's defined at 5, I can get my limit by substituting in a 5. And that's going to be 1 over, that's going to be square root of 9, so 3 plus 3, 1 over 6. And the last thing we'll look at on this part right here is what happens when I work with a problem that has two variables in it. Well, when this happens, all I need to focus on is that I'm doing the limit as h approaches 0. Yeah, there's x's in it, but that works just the same way as if I had other numbers in there. What I'm really focused on is trying to substitute 0 into this problem and recognizing that I can't do that. I would be dividing by 0. So I'm not even going to worry about the substitution for the indeterminate form. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try to see if there's some way that I can work through this problem and get rid of that h in the denominator. And here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to expand everything. x plus h quantity squared. Hopefully you remember something about expansion, and that looks familiar to you. I'm going to distribute on the middle set of parentheses, and make sure I distribute this negative sign so I don't end up with the wrong signs in this problem, all over h. What I am going to do is find some terms that I know I can cancel out. I have an x squared minus an x squared. I have a negative 3x plus a 3x. Everything else looks like I can keep it. So I'll get the limit as h goes to 0 of 2xh plus h squared minus 3h all over h. And notice that I can factor out an h, or since I'm just dividing by 1h, I can go ahead and just divide each term in the numerator by h. It'll cancel out the h here, bring this h squared down to an h to the first power, and cancel out the h from the last term. And what I'll be left with now is a limit as h goes to 0 of 2x plus h minus 3. And I can now substitute in that h value of 0. This function is going to work for direct substitution. Well, the 2x doesn't have an h on it, so that's going to stay at 2x. That h becomes a 0, so it's going to be gone. The minus 3 also doesn't have an h on it. That'll be a minus 3. And what I'm left with is an expression instead of a number, but we should have probably anticipated that because there was no value ever given for x. The limit didn't revolve around x. I was never going to get rid of all the x's in the problem unless I ended up canceling them out here. It's okay to be left with an expression. You're actually going to see that's something that is going to become very important to us later on. So go, let's go ahead down to our last thing for this lesson. And the very last part of this lesson, we'll be dealing with piecewise functions and limits. I'm working with something like f of x equals square root of 11 minus x, but only when x is less than negative 5 and x plus 3 all over 5 minus x squared for all x values that are greater than or equal to negative 5. So we're going to break this down into three parts. Uh, the first two should be familiar are left and right hand limits. Recall that this is read the limit as x approaches negative 5 from the left of f of x. Well, negative 5 from the left is when x is defined for values less than negative 5. So to the left of negative 5, my function would be defined by square root of 11 minus x. And that function will be defined for negative 5. And so that will be the square root of 16, or 4. Similarly, if I look at the limit as x approaches negative 5 from the right, I want to look at the part of the piecewise function that is defined for values to the right of negative 5, which will happen to be this one. And so I will be looking at not just any part of f of x, but specifically this part of f of x. And I would have negative 5 plus 3 all over 5 minus negative 5 squared, which will give me a negative 2 in the numerator, a 5 minus 25, a negative 20 down the denominator, a positive 1 over 10. Now the big thing is, thinking back to your last lesson, these two limits do not match up. From the left I approach 4, from the right, I approach 1 over 10. This two side limit will not exist. This would be a situation where we'd have some sort of jump. Let's look at one more. Uh, g of x is defined in three different pieces. This first piece for when x is less than negative 1. The second piece for when x is in between negative 1 and this constant e. Recall that e is about 2.71. And the final function, natural log of x cubed, for when x is greater than e. So let's look at the limit as x approaches negative 1 for g of x. 
Now that is a two-sided limit, which means I'm going to have to think about both parts of it. I'm going to have to think about the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the left, which is this function here. And I'm going to have to think about the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right, which involves using this function here. Plugging negative 1 into both of those, I'm going to get square root of 10 minus this negative 1 square root of 10 minus 1, square root of 9, which will be a 3. Over here, I'll have 26 minus 5 times negative 1 squared. I'll have 26 minus 5, which is 21, divided by 7 is also 3. Those are the same value, which means overall the two-side limit will be equal to 3. Looking at problem 11, the limit as x approaches e from the right. Well, i got to find the function that works for values that are greater than e, which happens to be this one right here, which means I'm not going to be just working with any part of g of x. I'm going to be working with natural log of x cubed. And substituting into that, I can substitute an e in there. Get natural log of e to the third. Use your properties for logarithms in this case. Hopefully you can remember, if I have a power inside of a logarithm, I can move that power to be a coefficient. And then it just takes to remember that natural log of e is equal to 1. So it's going to be 3 times 1. This will just be 3 as well. And finally, the limit for g of x as x approaches e. Well, I already know the value as x approaches e from the right, I just need the value as x approaches e from the left. I need to see if those are going to be the same thing. And that's going to take on this value right here. Now, what I want to point out kind of a way, we can cheat a little bit on this one, realize that there's no way I'm going to get rid of an e out of this problem. I also know that the only thing that's going to make this equal to 3 is a negative 1. We saw that in a previous example. That is not equal to 3, which means the left limit does not match the right limit. This overall two-side limit does not exist. So that part may have gone a little bit fast, so make sure to pause, rewind, go back over those parts a few times, and ask any questions you may have on it, because it's really not all that confusing. It's just for piecewise functions, it's deciding which function to use for any particular limit. Realizing if I'm talking about a limit at one of these values where my function changes, I have to consider both the left and the right sides. So that has been your lesson on limits analytically or algebraically. Please make sure that you review and summarize your notes before moving on to the practice and complete all of the assigned practice problems before you try to move on to the next topic. Thank you for watching.